<laughs> really? <laughs> That's beautiful. So, um, this week was uh, somewhat difficult for me and my family. Um, we lost a friend that we hadn't really spoken to, or the, the husband of a friend that we haven't really spoken to for quite a while. And then um, we also lost um, uh, another family member. Well, they were, in, they were, they were important in our <coughs> journey when we first started studying the Bible. And uh, he's gone now. He uh, passed away yesterday. So, you know, it, it was a little bit difficult with that. But um, it's always good to hear, and Steve mentioned it a little while ago, birthdays. So I know of three specifically that have occurred. One yesterday, right? Eli's? Is that right? One Wednesday, correct? And one tomorrow. Yeah, she's looking up. I know you're looking. Michelle. Happy birthday, Michelle. Tomorrow is her birthday. Yes, amen. So, thank God that um, through all of this death and through all these things, you know, life, we can still celebrate life. I'm going to ask that you all stand up, please. Please stand. For those of you who remember, turn to your neighbor and say, Good morning, gorgeous. Happy to uh, the Bible, if you could turn to 1 Kings, back to 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 8 and 9. Chapter 17, verses 8 and 9. And it says, and I'm using the New King James Version, and it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Serapheth, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there, to provide for you. Let's go ahead and pray. Almighty Father, you provide. And as we just finished singing, God, you do take care of us. And God will take care of us. No matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing, God, you are with us. And for that, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I ask that you bless this speech, that it touches the hearts, Lord, of those who are going to hear it, and that they imbibe it, and that they, 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 they cherish it, Lord. Give them their message that they need to hear, Lord. I pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Arise. Go. We saw that command, and it's funny, because we look at that first command, we say to ourselves, Arise. And then it's followed up by what? Another command. Go. God knows what he's doing. So you're too busy to read the Bible. Well, what if your Bible reads itself to you? It, well, that's exactly what this app will do. It gives you the Arise, go, it says. Listening to the Bible when you are online or offline. It even has quizzes that will help deepen your knowledge of the scriptures. So you can grow in your relationship with God. That's okay. You know, guys, I grew up, and just to, to let you know, my parents always told my teachers, don't put him next to a window. Just don't do it. <laughs> For obvious reasons. <laughs> um, I can still remember this. It was a hot day in August 2008. Life was pretty good. Life was great. For about eight to nine months prior to August, about December, January, 
my wife and I had begun studying for the cold portrait, I hope I said that correctly, uh, from a church from Midas, which is down there near central Lower Valley. Um, and we began studying the Bible with him. After about eight or nine months, we were still kind of on the fence, but we knew we were going to be baptized at some point. Now, for those of you who know me, my family consists of myself, my wife, my two older daughters, and my son, David. Well, as was expected back then, we went to church on Sabbath now. So this particular Sabbath morning, it just so happened to be our turn to host a Sabbath meal. So we invited family friends, corporal tours, of course, and um, we were going to eat at our house. So it was decided by my wife and I that uh, I wanted to get a bit of a head start. So Lydia and I agreed that uh, I would leave church a bit early that day. I'm not proud of that, but I did. I left church a little bit early. And um, as expected, I wanted to get home and you know, get the prepared food and put it in the oven and get it ready for our guests. So I grabbed my son. He was about 14 months old at the time. I put him in a car seat. I put him in the car and we left. Again, my wife and I, uh, she was telling me, you know, giving me heads up, you know, we're on our way, what have you. I got home, I parked in front of my house, got out of the car, we entered the house, turned on the stove, took the food out of the refrigerator, placed the food under the stove, turned on the air conditioner, and waited for my family and our guests. After a while, finally everyone arrived. Once in a while, just come in through, once in a time. But because of the distance from the church to my house, and by the time everyone began to arrive, it was about, I'd say maybe about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, going on an hour from the last I had seen of my family. So, going on about an hour, from the moment that I did arrive at my house, my youngest daughter, Eileen at the time, comes up to me. She's about six years old at this point. She says, Dad, where is David? An hour or more passed. My little son was strapped to his chair in the car. Um, my son, whom God entrusted to me to protect. I don't remember running to the car that day. I just know that I did. I don't remember taking David from his seat. I don't remember that. It was very hot. I do remember the color of his skin. He was bright red, extremely hot to the touch. He wasn't moving. That image, uh, that image that morning, just burned into my memory. But my God, dear God, he was breathing. I don't remember much of what happened after that. I don't. I just remember they grabbed him from me, we ran in, ran into the rooms. I don't remember much. All I can remember is the brothers starting to tell me, brother, it's gonna be okay, it's all right, he's fine, he's getting better, you know. The women who were there that were attending to him. Um, but for the next few days, my thoughts were very unclear. Those consolations, brothers and sisters, I'm not going to lie to you. Those comforting words that were, that were coming from the well-intentioned brothers that were there. The I'm sour, the, 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 the uh, brother, everything's going to be okay, you know. Because he actually sickened me. Then they began to anger me. I know these were loving gestures and loving words of comfort. But all they did was remind me over and over and over again of what could have happened. For the next few weeks, I had to learn to accept what I did. For the next few years, I had to learn to forgive myself. To this day, it's still very difficult. But for the rest of my life, I will know that it was God and His profound mercies that touched me and my family that day. Amen. Today, I still loathe my ignorance on that Sunday afternoon. Other things were more important. But I vowed and I will continue to respond by praising my Heavenly Father for what He taught me that day. 
I don't know why, brothers and sisters, that I was spared the pain that so many other families endure with the loss of a child, especially at the hands of that family. What I do know was through the infinite and loving mercy of our God, my son was alive. And not just alive, but flourishing. He is sitting here today because I believe God has a purpose for him. Amen. The pain, the confusion, the agony that God prevented that day is what brings me here today. I worship God, not because life is easy, but because life teaches us to overcome. Life strengthens us. Trials and tribulations, they prepare us for the eternity that he has promised us. Until that moment, life was good, it was great, it was comfortable. And yet I'm looking back at the Cold War tour, even after months of sitting on the fence, going back and forth and arguing and fighting, what have you, poor guy, I, I, I was still not that convinced I was going to be baptized until that moment. I was very comfortable there. I didn't have to act. I didn't have to make a move. I could be lukewarm and still enjoy church. I wasn't a member. I didn't have to do anything. Nothing could break me from that. Except God himself. And he did. Don't get me wrong. I don't blame him for what happened that day. He didn't cause it. What I do know is that he protected me. He protected my family. He protected my son. He guided me through struggles. I was being forged in fire at that moment. He opened my eyes. And I learned that he is not just love. Yes, God is love. But he is also merciful. He is faithful. He loves us. Brother David, I'm not sure I saw him earlier. He brought this to light, Jeremiah 31, 3. And it says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, he qualifies that, with loving kindness have I drawn Even after knowing God's saving mercies firsthand, living still hurts. And I still ask, why should I worship sometimes? I don't know what your position is, but since I am here today in front of you, you can judge me or accept me. That's okay. That's fine. Either way, I've come to understand that my Lord Jesus Christ accepts me for who I am. He welcomes me into his forgiveness. All I need to do is accept this invitation. Brothers and sisters, this is the first time I've ever shared this with you all. And I'm not here to try to bring you down on this beautiful Sabbath. But I bring this message to you because I have noticed more and more and more that as time draws closer to the coming of Jesus, we as Christians are defining when and why we should worship God. As if it's to our own convenience somehow. We turn from the obedience to God according to his will and turn it into worshiping him according to ours. When life is going well, when we are living a life that seems to have no problems, no worries, worshiping God is pretty easy. Don't you say? And when life is painful, when we are suffering, our response to worship may not be so readily available. It can be filled with confusion. Today, I really don't want to answer that question. Why do Christians suffer? Why does God allow evil things? I'm not going to answer that today. I wouldn't know how. But what I can tell you is this. I can't overlook the fact that liars, thieves, drunkards, fornicators, blasphemers, they all seem to prosper. Well, the Christian, the demon is honest, hardworking, humble, meek, generous, God-fearing, he loses his health, his jobs, his home, family, sometimes his freedom, his life. And what's worse than losing your life, brothers and sisters? Well, I'll tell you what's worse than losing your life. Losing your faith, losing your hope before you die. Amen. If one surrenders completely to God and accepts his son Jesus Christ as a Savior, then why doesn't God come to immediately rescue the believer? To correct the problem, to relieve the suffering. 
And if not correcting the problem, how about just the pain? Why the pain? But no, crisis rears its ugly head, and the believer suffers. The unjust jump at the opportunity to say what? I know you all are familiar with this. I told you so. <laughs> Where's your God now? Satan loves to weaken our spirits. God doesn't care. God doesn't hear your prayers. God isn't what you believe him to be. God doesn't love you. God loves your suffering. Where is he? He's gone. I'm reminded of the biblical story of the rising of the prophet Elijah. If I may bring you to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. It is the first book of Kings. We are given the uh, history of the Hebrew monarchy, beginning with the death of King David and uh, the reign of Solomon. Now, by the time we get to chapter 17, where we're going to study for a little bit, we've gone through about a half dozen so kings. You know, it's weird about this book, but when you look through it, there's a whole ton of names, and I, and I thought to myself, man, there's a bunch of kings before uh, uh, um, Ahab. But then I study that part, and it says he was a seventh, so, so be it. It's, it's a little confusing to me, but there we are. We've come to about a half dozen or so, and uh, here we find good old King Ahab. He's in charge. He's also well known for his wife. Do you remember who his wife is? Who? Jezebel. Jezebel, Queen Jezebel. Now at this point, I do want to remind you, Israel, though it's chin deep, not knee deep, chin deep in sin, apostasy, filthy idol worship, due in large part because of Jezebel and the cults that she, that she promoted. Israel, somewhat doing economically and agriculturally well. They're doing well. They're enjoying healthy trading with their neighbors, the Phoenicians. Uh, the land is producing good crops. Farming is good. But enter Elijah. Elijah comes out of nowhere. He grabs the attention of Ahab. And with what follows, we ultimately see the transformation of the nation of Israel. And why? Because of the faith of the prophet. Now, let's go ahead and uh, go to... 1 Kings 17.1. Don't laugh, I, I can't even use this today. Um, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. God calls Elijah out of those mountains, sends him to King Ahab. Pretty sure Queen Jezebel was there. And, and I'm thinking to myself, now keep in mind, na the nation at this time, they were well fed, they were fattened by this apostasy. They were worshiping false gods, one in particular, Baal, Baal, Baal. By the way, Baal, they believed was the source of life and blessing. He was called the great storm god, who supplied the earth with rain, moisture, water, and ultimately good crops. That's the god that did. Back to Elijah. Imagine, he's in this palace. Castle, I'm not sure. The kings live. Jezebel's probably next to him. And what does he do? He pronounces judgment upon the kingdom. Check that out, brothers and sisters. Look how Elijah states this judgment as well. First he pronounces upon whose authority he is speaking. What does he say? Whose authority is he speaking upon? The Lord God of Israel, correct? Yes, the Lord God of Israel. Then he declares his servitude to God. And then he senses the kingdom to famine. Elijah is established as a prophet. The rain stops, moisture stops, immediately. Verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Sherith, 
which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that, it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went, and what did he do? What did he do? He stayed there in the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. I imagine poor Elijah who's in this hall, however, about to pronounce judgment on the kingdom. I'm thinking about the moment he's walking out. You ever walked out of some place and you know that there's something bad's about to happen? That's what I'm thinking he's feeling. So he takes off as quickly as possible. Then God arranged for ravens to deliver food and bread twice a day and gives him water from the brook, a stream. His judgment became reality. Everyone around him suffers and dies because of the drought. And everywhere around this book, brothers and sisters, this stream, the land is baking. It's hot now. Have you ever seen when land or the desert is somewhat moist, has there's moisture in it, and then it immediately dries? It cracks up. That's how I'm envisioning this area now. Nothing green can no longer be seen. All vegetation is dead or it's dying. What does that mean when vegetation dies? What dies next? Everybody, right? Animals and people. But I imagine this brook, this little mountain area, how beautiful it must have looked. You see the prophet who's resting peaceful and grateful in what we would think is secured abundance, correct? But now we are witnessing God ministering to his servant. And because of this faith, he thrives. While all around him the unrighteous suffers, Elijah was not alone. Let's read chapter, verse 6. Verse 6 says, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Ravens. Meat and bread, to be exact. But ravens, guys. Ravens, brothers and sisters. Levit Leviticus 11, 13, 15. It specifically says a raven is an unclean animal. Imagine, brothers and sisters, eating from a pigeon. Maybe outside a pigeon breeds you eat. Maybe a crow, a chicken, I don't know. It's kind of nasty. Elijah would have had to have ignore, ignored everything he knew and everything he had been taught about diet. And about unclean animals. And yet eat from one. This verse speaks to me. It tells me that God is teaching us that he often delivers messages of life-saving grace using unclean vessels. He provides spiritual meat and bread to those in need by using the spiritually unclean. The guy giving a sermon today. What's more, on the other side of that coin, as he qualifies the unqualified that we got to say here at Northeast, Although I am unclean, although the, you brothers are unclean, he calls us to deliver spiritual foods to others for his glory. Pointing towards salvation. A theologian once said, but see too, how possible it is for us to carry bread and meat to God's servants and do some good things for his church. And yet, brothers and sisters, be ravens. Let's read verse 7. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, uh oh, because there had been no rain in the land. Are you shocked? Are you shocked? What can we expect? All around him, all around us, no rain, no water, no growth, death, dying. Of course, brooks and streams and rivers and bodies of oceans, those types of things, of course they're going to dry up. But wait a second. The only reason Elijah is here today, or there, is because why? Who told him to go there? And what did he promise him? 
bread, water, meat, crows to keep you company. Assuming we obey God as well, the only reason we go where we go is because, is because we believe God leads us there as well. Right? God sent him there. And God puts us here. And more importantly, he promises us that he will provide. We just finished singing that song. He's going to take care of us, right? So then why did the stream dry? Why do our brooks dry? Is this not the same God? Brothers and sisters, is this not the same God? With one thought, with one breath, created all that has been created? Is he that God? Is he that God, brothers and sisters? Is he that God? Then why can't he keep a brook full of water? Filled with water. But our creeks dry up anyways, don't they? And really, when, where in the world did those birds go? I wonder that. Where do all my unclean yet un yet qualified friends from church go? Where are they? Elijah! Where is your God? Imagine the shock, the disappointment. One day, water, dirty birds to keep him company, food, meat nonetheless. But now, a dry stream. He's alone. No water, no ravens, no more food. And don't forget, not only did the creek dry up, it dried up because there's no more rain. And why is there no more rain? There's a drought. Oh, yeah. The very drought he sent us the kingdom to. The very drought he pronounced judgment upon the kingdom has now reached him. But why him? Those other sinners, those other ball worshipers, they deserve it. This guy, you, God, you just established him. He's a good man, a prophet. He was called. He was qualified. And through faith, he obeyed. So why him? Again, the Bible doesn't tell us how much longer he must have waited there by the edge of that dry brook. Or how long or how hard that drought affected him. But it did affect him. Was he not thirsty in verse 10? When he arrived at his next stop? Maybe it was the walk. Maybe it was the drought. Maybe it was both. Whatever. The brook dried up. Was this enough to shake his faith? Would it have been enough to shake yours? And so, he waited. For the way he waited, he waited. Before this, his food and water, they were scheduled. They were a sure thing. Breakfast at 8, dinner at 6, and all the water you want, as long as that stream was full. But now he waited. Did God abandon him? Did God forget about him? Did God even care? And if God cared, where were all his promises? Were his promises a lie? Was God not powerful enough just to keep him there? Of course he is. And again, what happened to those birds? They're gone. But as he waited there, he listened patiently. And God spoke these words. Verse 8. Then, eight, uh, 8 and 9. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise! Go! Go to Zarephath, I hope I said that correctly, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. First ravens, now a widow. God, our faithful master, he moved Elijah. You see, brothers, God gives us an opportunity to thrive. He gives us opportunities to thrive in one situation or another. And then he moves us to another according to his will. Now, it depends. Here is the key. Not why or any of those things. We can grasp that. But here is the key to this. 
It depends on how we react to it, how we want to view this opportunity. It's not going to be a question of who's at fault. We can sit here all day and say it's God, it's Adam, it's sin, it's us, it's this. We can do all of that, yes. But ultimately, it's about how we respond. Arise, go, God says. Get up. Brothers and sisters, is it a moment of crisis when you come across these issues? You better believe it. Your pain, your suffering, it's not to be diminished. It's not to be minimized. But it's because of your faith that God values your heart, your pain, your grief. He does not delight in your loss or your pain. No, he delights in your response to place your faith in him regardless of whether your brook is full or dry. You are victorious because of God. And just like Elijah, at some point in the future, after you leave your dry brooks, the dry brooks of your life, you can look back and declare this victory. Confess that he is the one and only true God. The brothers and sisters, million dollar question, why can't we confess when we are afflicted? At the moment we are at the banks of those dry brooks of ours. God rejoices in those who find comfort, strength, and redemption in his bosom during and beyond the droughts of our lives. Change is not always fun. I don't like change myself. Nor is it all nor is it always welcome. But when we are called and he qualifies us, it does not mean we are safe or free from suffering. It means we are given an opportunity to spread his message, show Christ to others, brothers and sisters, by our actions and our words. It is an opportunity to edify others towards his glory. So like Elijah, Sometimes we don't move from our safe spots when life is going well. We might even sit a little bit too long on the side of that dry brook bread, brook bed, feeling bad, ravens don't come around no more, no more water. But if you cry out, you just listen intentively. God will guide you through patience, obedience, and faith. He will provide you in his safe spot Amen. until he says, Rise, move. His will is that we are not just to survive, but to thrive. To thrive as examples to others, as vessels, revealing the loving character of God and the saving grace of his son, Jesus Christ. To prosper in abundance within God's plans. Yeah, Brother Gus, but my brook is still dry. Dried up. And you know what? I was obedient. I followed his footsteps as best as I could. Life was good for a moment, he provided. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Sometimes we look at this as proof that we are favored. We do. And then, and then, and then, brother Fagan, the cancer. Strokes, heart attack, injury, car crashes, diabetes, amputation, adultery, betrayal, unemployment, homelessness, death, abandonment. I could go on and on and on. God, things were so good. Why me? Why this? Why now? God, why is it so important to you that you dream me of? Who, what do you want me to be filled with? We just sang in Psalm, or hymn 672, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Elijah had waited long enough by that creek. God had other plans for him. This was just the beginning. If you're not sure, read the rest of chapter 17 and 18. Think about what would have become of Israel, that whole nation, had that brook not dried up, had those ravens kept coming, 8 o'clock, 6 o'clock. I heard a pastor once say, 
to persist in the same place for long for the sake of survival, to persist in a place for the sake of survival, comfort, and security, is to allow ourselves to grow stagnant, disinterested, lukewarm, and I love these last two things, spiritually stunted, and theologically immature. Get up. Go. Move. You see, God desires more from us. He desires more for us. He created us in his image, not to die stagnant or in our own self-created sanctifications or, or, or even worse, in our own pains that, that, that we sometimes stay by too long. Yes, pain is real. Your pain is valid. But brothers and sisters, I implore you, I beg you, be still. Listen. Get up. Move. Arise. Go to service, the Bible says. Move with godly purpose. Put that dried up brook behind you. And yes, brothers and sisters, don't forget. I'm not saying that you should forget these things. Yes, glorify him for the protection that he gave you when you were in front of your personal King Ahab. Praise him for the provisions he gave you when you were at your brook. Birds with meat and bread. Your own personal water source. Honor him with what you learned from the suffering you endure when the very drought you pronounce catches up to you. And when you were alone. Move with godly purpose. Testify to others how you, how we are created to live in Christ, not to die with no hope. Jesus is your hope. God is a loving God. He is a creator. He moves within us. I'll end here. Your pain, your loss of purpose, has a purpose. It's not random. It's not coincidence. And much more, your suffering is not in vain. Brothers and sisters, it is an opportunity for you to grow spiritually. It is an opportunity for you to show others how God, despite our losses, provides for us. Amen. That provision is found in our only hope, which is in Jesus Christ. It was a hot August day in 2008. Because of my negligence, my son David should not be here. I'm sorry to say And mercifully, he is. Amen. My brook began to dry that day. When I got up, I moved. I'm still moving. That image. Brothers and sisters, that image. The, the, the window, the, that image. It haunts me to this very day. But my son's life is not over. Neither is mine. My son's purpose is found in his next decision. So is mine. So is yours. So Jesus, I pray to you that you make us your path. May our next step point towards you. Life was not over for Elijah at this point. Neither was his purpose. Brothers and sisters, your life isn't over. Neither is your purpose. Arise and move. Thank you.